Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Office Hours. We have a special guest with us, Dustin Cregan, who is the Vice President of Revenue Cycle Management for Class Research is here. Hi, Dustin. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, too. Welcome. Um, class Research, as I'm sure you all know, is the nation's leading research data and healthcare insight firm in the country. So anytime we can have Dustin with us, we really appreciate his time because he has very unique insights into giving us a clear line of sight into what works and what executives are implementing today. So today, what we want to talk about is the flood of all those new shiny technologies out in the market. Everybody's flooded, getting a million phone calls and emails every day. And the problem is, how on earth do you evaluate these solutions how do you figure out what's best for your company given the workload? So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the Catch-22. And also, we're hoping that you'll share some insights on trends mm -hmm. from your top 20 emerging solutions report. Perfect. Let's do it. So let's, let's begin with the need. What does your research show that the need is in health? healthcare today, specifically, what about in terms of um, innovation and RCM automation? Let's start there. Yeah, good question. I think we're all a very attuned to what's happening in healthcare. I think really kind of within the last eight months, it feels like our world has completely shifted. Um, you know, there's always been challenges around staffing. So staffing is, of course, something that is probably top of mind for every single provider. And it's not just the quantity of staff, like having enough bodies in chairs. It's really this um, turnover that we've had with the skill set. And so I'm talking about those maybe billers that have been around for 20 years that have left, right? And you're replacing them with someone who perhaps doesn't have any idea about healthcare. So, um, you know, staffing challenges on multiple fronts, including increases in wages, um, which is obviously great for the employees, but does put a lot of pressure financially onto um, health systems. Second thing, then a good segue is to the financial pressures that um, health systems are facing, right? So they've seen shrinking margins and not only that, but even tightening cash flows. So being able to uh, open that pipeline to cash is really critical. And then I think on top of all of that, it probably ties into both to some degree is just burnout. I think there's a there's a fatigue and there's a tiredness that's going on in in healthcare. And so um, when you when you take that environment and you boil that down, the need you know we, we've always talked about in the consulting world like people process technology. So we know we have a people issue right challenge that we just described. We know we have processes this revenue cycle is incredibly cumbersome. And so I think there's going to be a bigger emphasis on technology to kind of help pull us out until those other two areas um, lift up as well. Yeah, I think that's a very good, uh, it's, first of all, it's good to hear that there might be a solution uh, on the horizon, right? Because I think, uh, you know, coming out of COVID, everyone's like, I have absolutely no idea. I, I could build the plane while I was flying it during COVID, but now what? A, yeah. Absolutely, right? No For idea sure. what to do. Um, so if technology is the solution and healthcare executives don't have enough time to figure out which one to buy, what are they telling you about technology and, and what are they thinking? I, I'm sure they have like two or three fires on their desk that they can't put out. What are they telling you they are? Yeah, so interesting. One of those fires is the question in and of itself, which is they have actually said to class and I'm sure to other individuals as well, we don't have the time to sort through all of these solutions. I mean, we, we've got these, you know, these day jobs to do. And I don't have 45 minutes or an hour every day to kind of figure out who's doing what. And so there's a real need for strategic partnerships. Um, you, you know, obviously our, our data kind of, we cut through all of that and we use their peer networks to, to kind of make that data transparent. But when you look at the engagement that they have with vendors, you know, really being a good strategic partner is incredibly important. I think when you look at where they go for help, almost always, uh, you know, assuming that the vendor is currently doing a really good job, for them, or at least a satisfactory job, that vendor is considered is obviously the incumbent 
And those leaders will generally go to that vendor and say, hey, I'm having these issues or these challenges. Is this something that you can do? And so those vendors will usually get first crack at that. Now, outside of that, yeah, they're, you know, they're obviously being very mindful of what's happening in the marketplace. They're talking to their peers or picking up the phone, CFO to CFO or VP of Rev Cycle to VP of Rev Cycle. Hey, what are you doing? What's what's going on? But yeah, it's a it's a very extraordinarily large and time consuming challenge. So sometimes this results in a knee jerk reaction, right? It's like there's there's just, you know, so many riches out there that I'm just I, I can't I'm not going to do any of it. So what do you see happening? Is there confusion? Is there reluctance? Or is there just, you know what, I, I can't even deal with it right now. We're just going to have to figure this out on our own, which is yeah. a solution. Yeah, you could see that being, of course, one of the possible um, reactions. So we don't really um, see that. You know, a couple of data points is that, number one, we did a study not too long, but about, I guess it's been about a year ago with Bain. And, you know, part of that was when we were researching with executives, we asked about their spend for the coming year. And this, by the way, this is a little bit before this, this financial kind of these changes, but still, I think the, the data holds true. Um, what they were going to spend and where they were going to spend. So the good news for the rev cycle people on the call is revenue cycle was number one, uh, followed by security and then patient engagement, which does, you could potentially tuck into rev cycle to some degree, of course. Um, but the other piece of data that was fascinating was is that about a third, these are loose numbers, but a third was going, were going to increase their budgets for technology. Like, and basically the bet was to fix these problems, we need to invest. Um, another third was we're going to keep the budgets the same. And the budgets were fairly healthy to begin with. So, you know, that that's good news. And then there was a third that absolutely said, yeah, we have to pull back spend. We can't afford that. So I think overall that data suggests there is going to still be a healthy spend. What I do think will be different this time, though, is that the scrutiny is going to be a lot higher um, on what they're buying. And so um, if you if you consider even a while ago, there was a lot there's a lot of promises that were made even around just true automation about what can be done. It sort of felt like this magic wand. If you buy this, everything will you know work out perfectly for you. And we just know that that is not true. That is not how uh, RevCycle works. It's a very specific um, kind of use case, right? It's that kind of that death by a thousand um, cuts, right? Where you find one and you go and you fix that and then you move on to the next thing and you fix that. And that very intentional spend and that intentional problem solving is what we're seeing um, happen. And then on top of all of that too, I think there's a a greater expectation of ROI. So where I think before that an investment would be made and it was okay for a year or two to go by before you started to see an ROI, I think the demand for, hey, we need to see immediate relief pretty quick, like the product needs to work quick and we need to start seeing some ROI has taken um, a much, much more center stage um, in, in the conversation. That's a, that's a, a realistic burden, but it's a heavy burden on technology as well, because sometimes you just can't move the ship that quickly. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I, I actually think it, while it may feel a little discouraging um, to, to kind of come to that realization, I actually think it's a really healthy realization to say, you can't just buy one thing and it's just going to kind of make all of your wildest dreams come true. Um, it is a very intentional situation. And, and once you, I think, get your head in that space, right, and you find those partners that are going to help you um, with those processes, then, then you can see results pretty quick and you can start moving and turning results fairly quick. So what do you see, what does your research show is the best emerging solutions today for RCM technology needs? It must fall into some categories or channels that you see. Yeah, so that's a that's a really tough question to answer, and I probably can't answer it direct because you know best is 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 a difficult thing to define. You know, best is the best solutions are going to be those solutions that do a very specific that solve a very specific problem for the provider, right? They have this headache, right, and that solution is a perfect match for that. Um, and there's a lot of groups that are doing a lot of wonderful things. Um, I do think when you look at a couple of areas in the rev cycle that still is, are getting a lot of um, consideration. 
not surprisingly, and I hate to say it because I, I cannot believe it, we're still talking about denials management. We're still talking about claim statusing. After all of these years, you would think that we would be in a situation where that was pretty automatic. Um, it's not, you know, providers still have those, those problems in getting the right um, data. The other thing is, I really think that we're starting to get close to this threshold where we've used automation tools a lot for data aggregation and pulling like exception reports together, right? But if you think about the unique situation that comes from having advanced tools that maybe go out and, and create an exception report that create like maybe there's 75 patient names on this list that has an improper code or something like that. Well, you take that list and you actually give it to an employee and you've actually increased their workload. Now it's a, it's a great thing to be involved with, right? It's a, it's a great fix and it needs to be done, but you're actually increasing the workload of the employee because now they have that list for and other lists. So solutions that can really start to even try to like, and, and I think we're a little ways off to some degree, but append the data and actually kind of resubmit claims and really kind of keep pushing things forward seem to get a lot of traction right now. Um, the other thing I would say is anything in and around um, making sure that data is clean on the front end. So we're, you know, this falls probably more into the patient engagement realm, but so much of that patient engagement and digital front door tools can pull into the financial piece to make sure that flows. And, and so um, there's a lot of energy getting pushed um, into those areas as well. And then another one that I think is pretty exciting for RevCycle overall is autonomous coding. So that's that, that's definitely an emerging space, um, but it's here. And so, um, you know, the ability to, to basically output the codes for this unstructured data and, and the physician voice and having that happen automatically is, is really exciting for a lot of, uh, you know, providers and RevCycle leaders. So I, but I want to um, encourage our attendees, please, if you have questions, just post them in the chat and we will pose them to Dustin, and have them answered for you right here. Uh, so I know you said, you know, choosing best and saying best is difficult, but there's always best in class. There's always best practices. You know, have, is that something that you've already talked to us about, or is that another category that we should, should, should discuss? Like an executive has you know, A through L on his desk, what should rise to the top? In terms yeah. Of um, you mean as far as the, like the, the best solutions? Yeah, like are the, is there um, specific functionality they should look for? Is it um, different channels they've worked with? Is it having things like autonomous yeah. coding listed as one of their services? You know, what is it? Yeah, good question. Um, so I am gonna I'm gonna answer it this way. Um, after all of the research that I have seen, and all of the providers that I've spoken to, and all of the vendors that I work with, at the end of the day, businesses are still about people. Um, and when that is when that is right, and when I say people, I am talking about like strategic, like starting at the sales cycle, right, and making sure that the promises are met. Right. And the expectations are clearly set right from the get go. The implementation team really scoping and understanding what's happening and really saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, your situation is a little bit different. You have this going on. So let's stop for a minute, figure this out, make sure it's correct, you know, from the get go. Um, you know, the support, the training, the, that being that partnership. I honestly believe that if that is missing from an organization that technology vendors will really struggle and providers will struggle with that technology because I just haven't seen a single just technology that just sits on its own and doesn't always need sort of this people that, that kind of surrounds that. So I always look for organizations that do a very, very good job with all of the people aspects of their business. And then, of course, yeah, absolutely. The product has to work. The product has to have the right functionality. I think in RevCycle, we all know the product has to really fit workflows. So you don't have a lot of swivel chairs and you don't have a lot of, you know, start stop going on. Um, and that's always hard to decipher. But certainly, you know, as we publish reports and as we publish data on our website, with categories, you know, the, the way that the provider voice works in our organization is, you know, we can assign some type of meaningful metric to that and we can see what, what organizations do better than others. So I'm glad you brought up your report. When you think about your report, mm -hmm. 
What other insights does it give you about emerging solutions and the impact they're having on healthcare? Were there any surprises there for you? I mean, to me, uh, companies that one third want to increase their budgets, a huge surprise, but. Yeah, um, so it'd be helped us if I can just give quick context on the report that you're referencing so that uh, people know what it is and what it is not. Um, we at class, we will engage with a lot of smaller um, vendors that are emerging, right? It goes back to the CIO saying to class, I don't have time to sort through all of this. And so class, what can you do? So we've actually been engaging with smaller organizations that they might only have six customers or eight customers or 10 customers. And so we will do these initial reports on these small um, emerging technology and we will publish. And so we did, um, I think we did close to a hundred or maybe 80 last year. And we took the ones that scored essentially above an 85 out of a hundred. And we took those, and I think that ended up being around 45 or so. And then we had different leaders in healthcare, so providers, go through and, and sort of rate those solutions against the quadruple aim of healthcare. Um, and so that's what this, this report came about, or how it came about. So it's not an exhaustive list of everybody in the, in the country, of course, but I think it's a good sample. Um, so the things that I, I think surprised me is, first of all, there is a lot of emerging technology. Like there is, and, and they're getting very specific with certain use cases. So for about any challenge that a provider has, you can find somebody that says, that is what we do. Now, the idea is that they will continue to expand, of course, right? Their services and, and solution, but they're very specific in what it is that they are doing. Um, the general, I think, energy is really around, I think, reducing costs, um, essentially in healthcare. So we're seeing um, a lot of like data, data groups that are looking at data in different ways and providing insights, actionable insights that have a, a bigger impact. We see technology for sure, even around like uh, remote patient monitoring or telehealth. And I think we all know that, that that intrinsically makes sense to us, right? Staffing challenge, you know, solve it by, by virtual interaction. And so um, that was an area that seemed to be um, uh, something that had a lot of uh, energy and potential. Uh, things around um, patient safety, things around um, also even like process mining. So I don't know, that's an area that, um, I don't know if it's emerging, it's been around for a while, but really looking at like RevCycle organizations and, and understanding who's doing or where the bottlenecks are and how they can improve. Um, but honestly, it's as wide and as varied as you would imagine. And I think that also speaks to the complexity of healthcare, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. Uh, we have a question uh, from one of our attendees. What is there for dental denial for, for software um, as well as what is out there for staffing needs? Do you see anything in that space? Yep. Um, so, well, yes and no. Unfortunately, class actually doesn't do any measurements in the dental space. I am actually aware of those clearinghouse. I'm a little closer to it than, than I was even surprised myself. But unfortunately, we don't have any data on that. It's something we're, look, we're looking at the future at class, but as of now, we don't. Um, staffing is, yes, is very um, a big, a big um, topic, it's particularly AI-driven solutions that can really maximize um, schedules for clinicians and matching clinicians to the right shifts and, and even sharing staff among this, like different locations within the hospital system. Um, I'm actually not the research director over those areas, but if you wanna shoot me an email and you have a specific question, we have tons of data around that, but there is a lot of effort for sure in that area around staffing and staff utilization and, and uh, efficiency maximization. Great, thank you. There's another question. Can any provider reach out to class to ask for their opinion on a specific vendor or does one need to be a member to get this information? Love that question. Whoever answer, asked that, fantastic. Um, so actually we are, we're very mission driven towards the provider. And as a result of that, providers get access to our data for free, uh, both on the website and all of our reports and even our events. So we actually have a RevCycle event coming up. Providers can come um, to those for free. The intent being we give them back as much information as we can. Um, to get access to our website, which is behind a paywall, 
Um, all we ask is they be willing to participate in at least one product or service evaluation that takes about 15 minutes. And once they do that, it you know they have free reign of the, the website. But even if they didn't, we'd give them access because that's what we do. That's great. Um, okay, so another question. We are beta testing an autonomous coding product currently. The vendor even goes one step further talking about direct to bill, no human intervention. The big concern as a coder is how this increases the risk of increased coding denial, incorrect coding, et cetera. It seems counterproductive to take it to the direct to bill level versus fine tuning the software to assist the coder who will confirm and finalize before the claim goes out. Is this a common thing now for software vendors to be pushing for direct to bill versus just AI assisted coding? Yeah, such a great and a deep and complex question. So first of all, um, you know, we didn't mention any vendor's name. And so this is not an assessment on where, you know, who that is and, and what's going on. But my, my general feeling overall with all automation is there's this idea of what we can do today and then what's possible down the road. I mean, even if you want to use a parallel of like self-driving cars, I mean, most cars for a long time, there, there was no self-driving car. It was really just like lane assist and, and, and those kind of like safe, advanced safety features, but the, the person still drove the car, the pilot still flew the plane, right? And then sure, there might be a day in time where literally there's nobody in cars and all over the place and that's what's happening. And I know that, that that technology is really advancing quickly, but the point is, is that I believe that same pattern exists here, right? Wouldn't that be wonderful if you could just have that all automated and it kicks it right out the door? I think the difference between now and that scenario, the gap is still really significant. Not to mention, I think you have to bring along the comfort level of executives on something like that, where knowing claims are just getting pushed out the door without a high degree of scrutiny. I mean, you don't want to get into fraudulent billing or like those kind of situations as well. So anyway, point being, I think we have a long way to go, but it's a wonderful vision, right? I agree with that. That'd be fantastic. Then there's, there's an addendum to that question saying, the physicians are concerned about direct to bill with no human coding as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. In fact, you know, if you think about it, they would be the ones that would be most nervous about that given their licenses and their good name and you know all of the above so yeah again i think it just reinforces this idea that the evidence of the outcome right that the outcome basically of these processes must support be supported by trust and the trust will continue to grow as that feature functionality grows and it proves itself um, but that's going to take some time so is it, we have a question about automated prior authorization solutions. So is that yeah. the same answer as coding that prior auth needs that human interaction? Yeah, um, probably not to that degree where we're talking about getting claims this, you know, going all the way through that kind of the coding process and going out the door, right? Um, prior authorization is a, a big beast right now. And it's really no fault of, I think, the technology, right? We have a lot of issues with kind of payer standardization of data and, and um, the, getting access to data and portals, like being able to get through portals and all of this kind of stuff. I think we're the, the, the industry, we're our own worst enemy in that for sure. And so um, I think the regulations coming, hopefully, if done correctly and they're implemented the right way, will help with some of that. I think we will um crack that nut of prior authorization much much sooner than than um, some of these other issues that were brought up um which is is so needed because at the end of the day it delays patient care and there are some really horrible stories about patients not getting the care they need because of not being able to get the prior authorization so anyway um it's still fraught with challenges i think there there's still a lot of groups that struggle getting it done successfully at scale and at volume but um you know, I think we're getting closer to that. And it's something that, you know, you know, when the government is talking about it frequently, hopefully something's going to come through. So. Uh, so there's one more question. Um, and the question is, given the fact that you mentioned earlier that one of the goals of technology is opening up uh, the doors to more cash, 
why do you think it is that executives hesitate to embrace technology as probably the fastest way to get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the answers are probably going to be as varied as the, the people who are on the receiving end of this. So it's very much a generalized um, answer, I think. And, and one that I see, I think there's there's a multiple um, there's multiple reasons. One, um, I do think investments have actually been made in technology. Um, but if you and I think sometimes the the way that maybe leaders and provider organizations view ROI might be a little bit different because if you implement, say, some automation that really frees up a lot of man hours, but you don't reduce your headcount, right? And by the way, I'm not an advocate of that, the way that came out. No, but you can repurpose people to do more complex things, the things that people should do. Um, it's not always seen on paper. And so when, I think when people are budgeting for technology investment, they want to see this. Well, why spend $100,000, but I got $2 million back, right? And sometimes that's not always clear. And so it, it feels for some people who are making those decisions that they're just spending more and more money. I, I think that's unfortunate because um, you, have, you have to progress your rev cycle to where your individuals are doing the highest order of things, right? So I think that's one thing. Two, I... I've actually been surprised at the number of failed or unsuccessful use cases for automation. So whether it was just over-promised and under-delivered, we've seen a lot of that. Um, I've even talked to people who have, quote, bought automation, right, to be too general. Um, it hasn't even been implemented yet. So the implementation teams haven't even done anything with it yet. So I think in some ways we've, as an industry, we have these some prior history that has not bode well. And so we're a little bit hesitant to go do this again. So hence that idea of having a partnership that you can trust with your vendor and you know they're going to do it, that unlocks that. But I, I do think there's hesitation in those two areas. I think that's important. I think I've, I've seen that several times in several different institutions myself, where if one thing doesn't work, it tends to be categorized as it's not one thing. It tends to be categorized as the whole, all of them all the time. And then that's never approached again. So that's not yeah. productive. Yeah. Yeah. So before we leave, give us your contact information. So all your secret emails and all your secret phone numbers. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Uh, no, so the best way to reach me, uh, you can, first of all, if you don't want to even write this down, um, but through the website, so class website, you can hit me up. Um, but I am Dustin.Cragen, C-R-A-G-U-N, at class, and that's K-L-A-S, uh, classresearch.com. And uh, please, like, yeah, send me an email. Hit me up on LinkedIn. It's always great to get connected to people. Um, I post a lot, well, relatively. I, I post some good things on LinkedIn about upcoming events or reports that we've done. Um, and honestly, you're always welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to, to share what I can. Well, we have one more question here before we go. Yeah, and let's do it. This person is listening very, very carefully. They're saying they're very curious about the failures that you were talking about, but I don't know specifically what failures they're talking. Oh, failures of technology so that executives don't go back and, and use them again. That's what we're talking about. Uh -huh. Failures of technology, yeah. So is the question just about like what type of failures or? Yeah, yeah. Someone who wants to poke and make you come up with specific examples. Oh, um, well. <laughs> I would say for every use case, you're probably going to find some um, some example. I think the best way to answer that is probably more from kind of the vendor uh, lens. But honestly, I mean, I think I think when you look at um, well, look, I've seen I've seen a lot of failures, if you want to call it that, in a prior author prior authorization space where you're using RPA to to just inundate websites. I think with automation. We're seeing that that is really struggling right now because payers are getting really um, abrasive. They're actually putting up more and more friction about getting their, their websites hit. So I think that that is actually a big one that we have seen um, a lot with. And then I also think these this idea that automation can just solve every problem, um, mm -hmm. that's not entirely true. Right, you can't just fix everything with just going in and automating with RPA or screen scraping. You can do a lot, but it's a very um, kind of well thought out approach that needs to happen. 
So sorry, I can't be more specific, but honestly, I could find a failure in every single use case, denials, management, statusing, low balance, adjust probably not low balance adjustments. I think most people can do that, but um, yeah, it, I think it just boils down to vendor. Yeah, well, I think you gave two really good examples. So, well, thank you as always. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, we appreciate it and your insights and it's been great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.